Oh, people. <laughs> Morning, church. Get all wired here. Great to see everybody today. Wasn't sure how many people we'd have with uh, the snow being so treacherous out there. So if you get stuck on the little hill right there, they got so close. Then they have turned around and went home after that. But but I'm glad uh, I'm glad you guys made it. I understand if people didn't feel comfortable or confident driving, and maybe they're listening online. And it is nice that Lewis uh, organizes our website where we can listen to all of the sermons online. Amen. Appreciate Lewis doing that. It's not reason to justify just skipping church and listening later, okay? I don't want you to do that, but it is nice that you can listen to it online. And in the future, we're uh, working on ways to have video where we can really see uh, the entire sermon like on video online and we can archive those, possibly even see those live in case there is a reason you can't get there. And it is encouraging with our website that we get hits from literally all over the United States and all over the world. I mean, many different nations, people come in and listen to our sermons. And so it's a great opportunity that we have have to serve other people and that Lewis organizes to be able to serve the rest of the kingdom and that your amens inspire everybody else to think, man, in Denver, they're really listening to those words. Amen. Wow. Yeah. I hear the, the rumble of zeal there. Amen. We, uh, we began a new series uh, a couple weeks ago. Wow. It's been a couple weeks already focusing on one action, the one action that we can take that can literally, directly and eternally impact every area of our hearts, our relationships, our lives, and the lives of people throughout the world. This one action that we've been talking about, of course, is prayer. We've called this series, The Power of Prayer. And that fits in with our overall theme for the year, His Divine Power. Because I remember our whole goal this year is to open the eyes of your heart to convince you and, and make you aware of the power that is there. That it's not just, maybe God will give you another power. No, the power is there. If we just realize and learn how to tap into it, there's just extraordinary, miraculous things that await. And so this fits in with that series, or that overall theme of His divine power. And I want to go through a little bit of review to talk about what we've talked about so far on this power of prayer. The first lesson, in lesson one, we talked about the foundation of prayer. And we described how the foundation of prayer is not really in any action we take, but is found in the very heart of God. The foundation of prayer is the heart of God. It is God. He is the one who created it. He's a God who cares, and He's a God who hears. And again, if you remember nothing else from this series on the power of prayer, I hope that sticks. No matter what's going on, you remember He's a God who cares, and he's a God who hears. Amen to that? Yeah. Then, last week, we began talking about this topic of the effectiveness of prayer. And we looked at part one last week on divine intervention. That truly one of the greatest effects of prayer is to influence the will and prompt the action of the almighty creator of the universe. That's just... That's just that can't get old, all right? You let that get old, Satan has filled you with a powerful delusion. You've got to just go, oh my gosh, I can influence the will. I can actually shape the will. And it's only by the grace of God. It's not because we're so awesome. Oh, prayer is just by His grace, but we can shape the will of God. We can influence Him and prompt His actions just when we pray. It doesn't mean you have to... Pray louder. It doesn't mean if you cry out louder, he hears more. He's like, okay, okay, it's bugging me. You know, answer it. That was the persistent widow. Okay, that's not God, you know. But it's just thinking. You can just think a prayer and influence the will of the creator of the universe. How amazing is that? And so then we talked about some examples in the Bible of this divine intervention. And we saw how one prayer saved a family. One prayer saved a nation. One prayer saved a friend. And one prayer saved a life. What have your prayers done in this past week? Have you prayed expecting that they would be powerful and effective? That's the whole theme behind this. That we really want to, we want to pray specifically, believing that our prayers absolutely resonate in the heavens and make an absolute eternal difference. Let's pray like we really believe that. The overall goal 
of this series is that we pray more, right? That's the overall goal. Not just that we go, oh, that was nice. It was nice just to think about prayer for 30 minutes there. That's not the goal, okay? That's nice. I'm glad if you think it's nice. But the goal is that we pray more, that we pray with more quality, understanding and embracing what, what prayer is really all about, and that we pray with more quantity, that we realize this is such a valuable thing. Why limit it to my goal of 20 minutes? Why limit it to my goal of 30 minutes a day? Why, why go, oh good, I'm glad I'm done. Why not just like, get more and more? When something's really awesome, you don't just think, oh, I'm glad it's over. But sometimes don't we think of our prayers that way? Like, oh, check the box. You know, I did my exercise. I didn't enjoy it, but I did it. I feel better. We don't want prayer to be that way. We can pray as much as, as we can. So I hope this series inspires you to pray with more quality as well as to pray with more quantity. And on that note, why don't we just go to God together in prayer right now. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you that you care and that you hear. You know what's going on inside each and every one of us. You know the wrestles. You know the battles. You know the guilts. You know the joys, the fears, the frustrations. We can kind of fake it with other people, but you know, and you care. And we're so thankful that you care for each one of us, and we're so thankful that you hear us. That at any point, we can just think in your name, that we can just think thoughts to you, and, and you hear them so clearly, so effectively. Thank you for being that kind of a God. You're amazing that you give us this access. Deepen our understanding on prayer. Shake off our traditionalism with prayer. Shake off whatever has structurally built up over the years that's limiting us to really commune with you in the way that you desire and help us to truly encounter you in prayer in a way that we never have before. Help us to be inspired to pray more with more quantity as well as more quality. We love you. We commit this time to you and pray you'll speak through your words right now. In Jesus' name, amen. The effectiveness of prayer. Today we're going to go into the effectiveness of prayer part two. The effectiveness of prayer part two. Okay, part one was divine intervention. Now we're going to go into part two. And as we said last week, unquestionably, as James 5.16 says, the Holy Spirit inspires, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. What a great one-liner that is. The prayer of a righteous man. And the NIV, the newer versions, the NIV say the prayer of a righteous person in case the sisters were feeling left out. Like, what's up with that? But it means, you know, man in this generic, you know, human, you know, kind of sense there. But the prayer of men and women is powerful and effective. There's no question about it. But it's fair to ask this question of, okay, it's absolutely effective, but, but, but what is it effective at? You remember how we posed that last week? What is it effective at? How is it really effective? In what way is it effective? Rate the effectiveness of your prayers on a scale of 1 to 10. What effect does prayer really have? Divine intervention, as we talked about it, is the first on the list to command the attention. And I mean command, quote unquote, you know, rivet the attention of the Almighty God. That's an amazing thing. But there's so many others. So many other ways that prayer is powerful and effective. Sometimes we just think of it as a bunch of requests. And we measure its effectiveness based on whether we got what we asked for or not. That's such a shallow understanding of what it means to say the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. There's so many more great effects. And so today, we're going to outline some of the other great effects that prayer can have. Some of the other ways that prayer truly is effective. Number one is this. Closer relationship. Closer relationship. One of the greatest ways to grow in any relationship is to communicate. You go to a marriage retreat, you're going to hear a lot of lessons on communication. Communication lies at the core of it. I remember when I was dating Barry and... When I first started to date her, Mark Van Tine, I see him back there, he remembers that, you know, there's a bunch of brothers, you know how it was, you know, a bunch of brothers would date these girls and you'd be on the rotation, you'd get like one date a month, you know, and you had to strike for that because if somebody got your date that month, then you got to like wait till the next month, you know, and so anyway, we, we'd get one date a month, well, when I was starting to like her, I was like, what am I going to do on the date? The last thing I wanted to do was go to a movie. I go on a movie, with, no offense, but with those other ones, okay? That, I, I, if you go on a movie date, don't think that means they don't like you, okay? But, but I'm just saying for me, because I thought, man, I got one date this month. I want to talk. And I'm not like a big talker, but I go, I, I want to catch up. 
I want to hear. I, I don't want to just be sitting there watching, you know, Jeremiah Johnson or something. You know, that was a date back then, date movie back then. But, but, but I, want to, I want to be able to watch Barry, you know, and I want to talk to her and hear what's going on and just, just communicate. I remember just having this keen passion to communicate. And then the date wasn't enough. So you figure out little ways to have weasel dates. You know, that you, I shared about it before at the house. So you bump into her on campus, you know, oh, I didn't know you were here or something like that. Or I had this post office box in the student union there. And, uh, and, and she knew my code to the post office box. And oftentimes we just put a little note in there for the other person, just a little note. And she'd go in, I'd check it during that. Oh, she'd leave me a note. Oh, no note. Like, oh, there's a note. And then I'd leave a little note back. And it was just a little tiny way to communicate. And any time, whether it was a bump into her on campus or these longer non-movie dates or, or, a, or a little tiny note in the post office box, all of those little communiques drew us closer. You want to grow in a relationship, you've got to communicate. And it's neat that the, the, more, the more deeply and genuinely and honestly you communicate, the closer you get. And the closer you get, the more deeply and genuinely and honestly you communicate. And it starts this great cycle that all centers and begins with communication. That's how it is in any relationship with, with family you got to communicate. And parents of teens, it gets harder, doesn't it? You know, like, so how was your day? Fine. So what happened today? Nothing. Normal day. You know, it gets, you're like trying to communicate. It's a challenge with, with our kids in every stage they go to. How do I get them to communicate? Then they're with their friends. Man, you can't get them to stop texting. You can't get them to stop talking on the phone. You can't get them to stop talking on Facebook. Dinner table, silence. You know, it's just sometimes it's a challenge. But you know, I want to get close. And to feel close, you've got to communicate. It works with family, with friends, with spouse, with anybody. Any relationship. Communication is the core. It's the building block to drawing closer. Well, one of the greatest effects of prayer has nothing to do with asking or receiving anything. It has nothing to do with any requests that we have, but rather just communicating. Just communicating with God and building a closer relationship with God. Again, it's one of those amazing things to think, not only can we rivet the attention and influence the will of the almighty creator of the universe, but we can communicate with them. We can talk. You ever like meet somebody famous, you know, and like you say a word to them, they say, well, nice to meet you, Marty, or something like that. And you're like, oh, I talked to him, you know, and you like tell people for years, oh, yeah, you know, and it, and it evolves, you know, we're like best friends, man, we are like so close, you know, I mean, you know, it just kind of evolves, but we like to have a little bit of communication to think that we can communicate with God, with God Almighty is amazing. This great Psalm is a great example of this in Psalm 86 in verse one, please turn with me there. Psalm 86 and verse 1. It's a great example of just communication in prayer. Psalms are so rich. Sometimes I, get, sometimes I want to do a series on the book of Psalms. One of the most enriching, rewarding studies that I ever did was really studying through the Psalms. When I was a young Christian, I used to kind of view them as cheese whiz. You know, that, oh, that's what the uncommitted people read Psalms. You know, hey, what are you reading? Psalms. Like, yeah, right. You just read one before you go to bed. You know, I thought they were just like, you know, kind of just extra fluff, you know, frosting. But then as I get older, I'm like, Man, Psalms are awesome. You know, there's just so much richness. And this is a great example of David just communicating with God through prayer. Just, just hear his words in verse 1. Hear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am devoted to you. You are my God. Save your servant who trusts in you. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. You are forgiving and good, O Lord, abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. In the day of my trouble, I will call you. For you will answer me. Among the gods, there's none like you, O Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, O Lord. They will bring glory to your name. For you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, O my Lord, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. For great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths of the grave. 
The arrogant are attacking me, O God. A band of ruthless men seeks my life. Men without regard for you. But you, O Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God. Slow to anger. Abounding in love and faithfulness. Turn to me and have mercy on me. Grant your strength. Grant strength. Grant your strength to your servant. And save the son of your maidservant. Give me a sign of your goodness. That my enemies may see it and be put to shame. For you, O Lord, have helped me and comforted me. Isn't that cool? You just get the idea. David's just like communicating with God. And in this communication, there's such a genuineness and such a humility and such a a self-awareness. And he just weaves between just saying, kind of here's where I'm at, God, and here's where you're at. And help the two to connect. It's just like this honest talk. He starts off in verse 1 just saying, I'm poor and needy. In verse 3, I call to you all day long. Verse 4, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Verse 7, in the day of my trouble, I will call to you. Verse 13, for great is your love toward me. And then in verse 17, for you, O Lord, have helped me and comforted me. David was just communicating with God and prayer was not just some rehearsed, repeated thing. It was just a conversation with his friend, a conversation with his father, a conversation with his God. And it was just so honest and genuine. You know, we do a lot of things in our Christian life to help us grow spiritually. We have sermons to help us grow spiritually. We have devotionals, midweek services, Bible talks to help us grow spiritually, discipling times. We read the Bible. We read spiritual books. We have a lot of things that that teach us and direct us and inspire us and channel us to draw nearer to God. But there's no one thing that can absolutely immediately cause you to be nearer to God than to communicate with Him, to pray to Him. That is like the final thing. All those other things just kind of prompt you toward this step. The greatest way you can really draw near to God is just to communicate with Him a lot. And the more you communicate, the more you're going to draw near to Him. Now, His love for you is infinite. His love for you is the same. But your closeness to Him is largely influenced by how much time, quality and quantity, you spend with Him. You catch that? It's not that you're earning his love more. Not that he goes, and you prayed for 45 minutes today, I love you more for it. Come here. You can be a little closer than those rest of the people. The 30-minute crew is in the back. You know, That's not the way God thinks. God is just as close to you. But it takes two to have a real genuine relationship. So we're not talking about earning his favor, meriting his favor. We're not talking about that. We're just talking about us drawing near to him and just being closer and more connected to him. And the greatest way you can do that is to pray. Nothing will help you grow in your intimacy with God, in your security with God, and in your closeness with God, like just praying to God. See him when you pray. Sometimes I like to close my eyes and just, just see him and just picture him. I, I don't know, everybody's picture, you know, maybe you have like the Santa Claus picture, you know, or something, you know, he's got a big beard or maybe this picture of light, you know, or the throne or, you know, you conjure up some images in the Bible, but I like to just close my eyes sometimes and see him, see him, tell him, share with him, bond with him, pray to him. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. One of the other greatest effects it can have is a closer relationship. Secondly, in the effectiveness of prayer. First, greater or closer relationship. Secondly, greater peace. Greater pre- peace. When we say the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Effective at what? Well, here's one of them. Greater peace. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Isn't that a great passage? Yeah. Another great effective prayer is the peace of God. The peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Kind of similar to 1 Peter 5, 7. He says, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. He goes through this passage, you know, talking about rejoicing in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be given to all. Do not be anxious. And you're like, well, how do I calm my anxious hearts? 
You know those days when you're just like feeling like super stressed and stuff? How do you just replace that with peace? The only way is to pray. He goes, just pray by prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. Just approach God. And one of the guaranteed effective things that's going to happen is you will find a greater peace. And this peace of God, I like how it says it transcends all understanding. Like you go, why do I feel better because I went and mouthed some words to, to a God that I can't even see? I don't know. It's like it transcends understanding. But there's something that comes down and just guards your hearts and minds. You've connected with the divine. You've encountered deity. And what rubs off like the glory of God rubbed off on Moses' face, you remember that? Well, the peace of God rubs off. And you just have this feeling of kind of like, oh, okay, the peace of God, will, it will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. I remember this brother back at LSU, I was thinking of this when I was thinking of Barry earlier. His brother, Will Lorenz. Mark, remember Will Lorenz? And Will was just this older brother to me as Mark was. And I'd be going through a challenging time and Will was just so encouraging. But he always had kind of one answer for everything that I would approach him with. I, I remember I'd come to him and, Will, you know, there's this complicated situation, you know, this sister and dating this and this brother, you know, some big thing like that. And I'd present some complicated thing and Will would go, well, John, I don't have the answer to your question. But I know Jesus, who's seated at the right hand of the throne of God, does have an answer to your question. Have you prayed about that? And I'm like, well, I was going to do that right now. You know, I was, on, I was on my way. And he would just always say that. You know, he'd just say, I don't know, bro. But Jesus does. Have you prayed? And then, like, things would be going bad. You know, sometimes maybe I'd struggle in a class or something. I'd go, well, man, oh, this happened with class. And it's so bad. And I'd paint some dark picture and want some encouragement. And he'd say, well, John... You know what? Jesus is still seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And I'm like, hey man, you know, I feel better about that. And I just love the way that when I'm feeling anxious and stressed, Will would just point me right to God. And that peace of God would guard my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. And I thought about that in our fellowship. When someone expresses their stresses and frustrations to you, and I'm glad we do, we need to express them to each other, in, at some point in there, are you being what Will was for me? Sometimes in our maturity, quote unquote, you know, as Christians, we kind of mature our way out of the simple spiritual truths. Yeah. That it's really not about our wisdom. It's not about our understanding. It's not about our cool answer. But it really is about connecting people with God. And I don't mean that we don't need to try to give answers or give direction. We do need to do that. But our overriding goal with anybody should be to help them connect with God. And not just in a trite way, like, have you prayed about that, bro? Not like that. Will did it in such a, a nice, hearable way, you know. But in some way, we need to communicate that with people in our fellowship. Or, you know what, let's just pray about that right now. Or I am going to pray for you about that. Could you call me later this week and let me know how it's worked? Let me know how it's changed. Just something that we point people to prayer and not just rely on our own wisdom. We've gotten so wise over the years that I think we're wise in our way out of just the wisdom of God. Our wisdom's foolishness compared to just pointing people to God and teaching them to enjoy the peace that transcends all your understanding that they will find if they go to God and not just you. Right. You understand what I'm saying there? Prayer works. It transcends understanding. It will give greater peace. The third benefit of prayer in the way prayer is powerful and effective Clearer perspective. Clearer perspective. Look at the scripture in Psalm 73. We'll read 1 through 28 here. That's whole song. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped... I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They're free from the burdens common to man. They're not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence, and from their callous hearts comes iniquity. The evil conceits of their minds know no limits. They scoff and speak with malice in their arrogance. They threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them 
and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how can God know? Does the Most High have knowledge? This is what the wicked are like. Always carefree. They increase in wealth. Surely in vain if I kept my heart pure. In vain if I washed my hands in innocence. All day long I've been plagued. I've been punished every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me. Till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so when you arise, O Lord, will you despise them as fantasies. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by your right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire but besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You will destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. Can you catch what's happening here? He's talking in the beginning. He's just like, and as for me, he's remembering this time, my feet had almost slipped. And he goes, I was just looking at like the non-Christians out there, okay, at the wicked, and just thinking, man, they got it so easy. You ever feel like that? I remember in San Francisco driving to church and we had this long drive. You think you got to come here. We lived over in Berkeley and we had to drive over to San Francisco and pay like $11 for parking. That was back in 88, okay? So that's like $400 an hour or something, you know? But anyway, but I remember just driving across there and it was like so far. And then you had to go over the bay and you go over the Bay Bridge and there's just like sailboats galore. I mean, the San Francisco Bay is, it's a stunner. I mean, it's just so beautiful. And you'd pass by all these sailboats and I'd like... Wow, wouldn't that be nice to just have a whole Sunday free? Like, just to play on Sunday? You ever go past the golf course and think that, guys? You're like, wow, you know, they can just do that all Sunday. Or, you know, you're like getting ready for church. You're driving out and other people are going to the gym. You're like, wow. You ever just envy the wicked? That, that's what Asaph was doing. He's like, man, their bodies are strong. They're always making money. They're making so much. Man, if I didn't have to give contribution over all these years, I'd be a millionaire by now if I would have invested every week a tithe of my, you know, my, my money. Like we have these thoughts. Asaph had those thoughts and he's like, he's like struggling. He says, my feet had almost slipped because I'm envying the arrogant. Their lives just seem so tempting and carefree. And then he, he thinks about his own life and he goes, man, every morning I have trouble. And sometimes you feel that way as a disciple, like, man, helping people and dealing with sin and confessing things, like, it, it's a burden. And sometimes you go, this is hard, just having to live like this day after day. That's exactly what he felt. So he felt this way in the beginning, just, man, I'm slipping, it's really bad. And then... His perspective completely changed. Completely changed. By the end, he's just like, man, I am so close to you. It is good to be near God. Man, I don't want to be anywhere else. He just completely changed his attitude. And you go, what made the difference? The feet almost slipping, envying the arrogant to just saying, man, it is good for me to be near God. I think this one line made all the difference. Verse 17, he says, till I entered the sanctuary of God. That was the transition in this whole psalm. It's like the hinge pin. He goes, man, the world is so tempting. The world is just pulling me in. I'm I'm losing perspective. Man, I want to be back in the world. And he goes, till I entered the sanctuary of God. And then it all made sense. When I drew near to God, when I approached God, when I prayed to God, when I got close to God... Then I saw their final destiny. Then I saw what really matters. Then I saw this eternal picture in which the sailboats are framed. Then I saw, you know, the heavens. I saw all the other dimensions of life, not just the ones right in front of me that look so good. And it completely changed him. When you approach God, your perspective 
changes. You get such a clearer perspective when you pray to God. It's kind of like uh, like the NBA. I don't know if you guys are into the NBA. You know, it's not the playoffs yet. I don't usually get into it till it's the playoffs. But in the NBA game, it's really amazing. You know, the coach largely just kind of sits there on the sidelines because he's already calculated his you know his game plan stuff. But if his team is losing, and, and basketball is such a momentum sport, like the other team's just hitting everything, and you're hitting nothing, and they're just racking up the points, what does a good coach do right then? Time out. I mean, you know, Phil Jackson wants time out. That's it. You know, you go, well, finally you sit off your bench. You know, you haven't done anything. Hold it. Just one time out. Pulls them all together. They just have this like 30 second time out. And just kind of pause. Just kind of relax. Just gain perspective. They relook at their game plan, come back in, totally turn it around. It's an amazing thing. The power of the time out is so great. Well, the world has so much impact on us. It has a powerful and profound impact as we're in this game of life. It influences us, conditions us, shapes us, manipulates us, and pulls us in through movies, TV, radio, internet, work, people, society. All these things just pull us in to the way the world thinks. And it's so easy to get sucked into it and twist it around to where good looks evil. And evil looks good. It's like, it's like playing bat spin. You ever play that bat spin game? You know, you're just, and you're just, you know, you're just like going sideways and stuff. That's what the world does so well. Prayer is our opportunity to stand up, time out, and just pause. Break the spell of the opponent. And gain a clearer perspective on what really matters. That's what prayer does. There's no better way to accomplish that purpose. You can go work out. You can go eat. I do both. That's my problem. You know what? But you know, and, and you can play a video game. I try that too. You can watch TV. Those, those things, you go to sleep. It just doesn't work. But when you enter the sanctuary of God, you've called a timeout. The evil forces cannot invade. And you will gain that clearer perspective. So the first three, number four, prayer is powerful and effective in what way? Number four and finally, stronger resolve. Stronger resolve. Matthew 26, in verse 36. I made the point in a previous lesson that one of the most powerful polemics for prayer, one of those powerful arguments for prayer is that Jesus prayed. You just kind of go, if Jesus prayed, how much more do I need to pray? If that guy, if the Son of God, the Word incarnate had to pray, and if he could pray and did pray, how much more should I pray? Look at an example where Jesus had to pray in Matthew 26, in verse 36. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to him, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to him, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if, it's not po- if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let's go. Here comes my betrayer. This is such a cool passage. You know, we study this in the cross study, and we read this so many different times, but it's such a powerful passage and example of how prayer gives you this stronger resolve. There's so much we could talk about here. But the main point I want to make is where Jesus was at at the start of the evening and where he was at at the end of the evening. At the start of the evening, in verse 38, he says, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Jesus is not exaggerating. He doesn't lie. This is what was going on. His soul inside 
was so overwhelmed with sadness, with sorrow, that he felt like, I could die. I just kind of want to die right now. I can't go on. His soul was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Why? Because his will was in conflict with God's will. There was a battle going on. And what he wanted was not what the Father wanted. And so he's feeling this battle with, with, with God, his will versus God's will. Do you ever feel like that? You ever feel this conflict of what you want, but what you think God wants, or what you know God wants? That's like life. That's just called life. I mean, that's, it, it, it is a constant battle. We face these, this battle. It's just called temptation. We face the temptation. When we're tempted with something, we're engaged in a battle where we go, God's will is this but my will is this, but I really want this, but he wants this. And we, do incre- we go to incredible lengths to tune out that voice that's saying, but God wants. And then sometimes we, we tune it out and then we sin. Then we feel so guilty because we're thinking about his will. And, and we're just in this battle where you can just get so guilty and just so frustrated or feel so tempted that you're like, ugh. That's what Jesus was wrestling with, this conflict between his will and the Father's will. We face it with temptations of both commission and omission. We face a barrage of temptations with commission to give into impurity, lust, pornography, some vice that we're struggling with, smoking, drinking, getting high, lying, getting anger, snapping. We all have our temptations of commission. Some people's temptations of commission, you go, I don't struggle with that at all. But there's areas you struggle with. So it's, it's all even, right? I mean, we're all like water balloons. You know, this side may squeeze, but it comes out here. Or this side, you know, we're all the same. Like, you can't look at someone and go, man, I've never, you know, had a problem with alcoholism. You go, yeah, but I have a big problem with impurity. We all have some area. And Satan knows that area. And he's just going to put all the ducks in a row to to get you to be super tempted in that area. So we struggle with those temptations of commission. We struggle with the temptations of omission. Man, I don't want to go to church. Hey, look at all the snow. I don't need to go. I, don't, I can't go. I can't make it. You know, we, that's how we justify it. Contribution, like, yeah, we keep talking about contribution. Can't wait for March when we don't talk about it much. Oh, but it's going to roll back, you know, for special missions. Maybe I'll miss that Sunday, special missions Sunday. I'll come back in June, you know, and I'm teasing about that. But we do go through mental hoops to just try to, like, justify why we don't need to tithe. Why we don't need to give our money. Man, I, I, I'll be honest, like, you take your paycheck, take off 10%. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know why it's so complicated. Honor God with your money. But, but we all do struggle at times. I mean, we struggle with temptations. We struggle with, I don't know if I want to be this committed. Should I go to Bible talk? Should I reach out to this person? He doesn't look very open. You ever like not reach out to someone? I, I didn't reach out to this guy a few years ago. He came into church last week. He's like, hey, John, I, I, made your, or I, I tailored your suit at Macy's. Nine years ago or something. I'm like, what? (laughs) He's like, yeah, I remember you. I still have your measurements. And I go, were you coming to church then? He said, no, I came two years later. And then I saw you and remembered. And I looked up your measurements and yeah, it was you. I'm like, wow. I'm like, you have a really good memory. And then then I'm kind of wondering, did I invite him? And he's like, I didn't ask him that, but he goes, you didn't say much to me. I'm like, I didn't invite him. (laughs) I just thought, man, I should have invited him. He would have come. You know, he came two years later. And, I mean, so he just didn't look open to me or something, you know, but he was open. Sometimes we just justify why we don't need to reach out. And God is just like crying out, reach out. But we have this little battle going on our will versus his will. Or to confess sin. Or to become a Christian. To get baptized and take that final step. We all have these wrestles that we go through. What did Jesus do when he felt this wrestle between his will and the Father's will. Well, he opened up to his close friends. I need some help. I'm overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He got open with his friends. He asked for prayers. Would you pray with me? But then they didn't really respond when he asked for help. When he asked for the prayers, they fell asleep. You ever ask for someone to pray for you and you think, I think they say they're praying for me, but I don't think they're really praying for me. Jesus experienced that. They're like, yeah, we're praying for you, Jesus. You know, like, man, are you guys still sleeping? Like, he, he, he tried to open up. He tried to ask, and then he just goes, bottom line, I just need to talk to the Father. So he just prayed. And when he prayed to the Father, I mean the change, just after praying to the Father, he comes back, rise, let's go, here comes my betrayer, let's go die. And you go, gosh, what got into Jesus? Overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, to rise, let's go, here comes my betrayer. You go, what happened? 
It wasn't his friends giving him all these encouraging words. It wasn't even them praying with him or for him. It's just he spent whatever time he needed with God until he got a stronger resolve that God's will would win. This is the decision I made. This is who I am. Man, it's God's will be done. Rise, let's go. But he had to pray three different times, three hours, until he got to that point. But it was prayer that gave him the stronger resolve. Wow. We look for stronger resolve. In sermons, which is great. In discipling, which is great. In the Bible, which is great. All those things are really good. In time, you know, sometimes in time, I'll get a stronger result. But the best way is just wrestle with God in prayer. Talk to God. Jesus says this key in between these two lines. He says, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body's weak. He knew. He knew what to do when you reach this point that I don't know whether his will or my will is going to prevail. I'm feeling weak. He goes, that's when I know to, I know to go to the Father. It's kind of like Ultraman. Do you remember Ultraman? Anybody remember Ultraman? Do we have anybody in the house that remembers Ultraman as a kid? Am I like the only one? Okay, you do. Okay, I remember Ultraman as a kid. I loved Ultraman. This is this guy. It's like a Japanese thing. And this guy is, is Hayata. And he has the beta, cap, beta capsule. And whenever he faces a really difficult time, he'd go like, shwack. And he hit this button and he'd turn into Ultraman. And Ultraman was like this superhero that would take on all these other Japanese dinosaur things. You know, like they're really into that over there. And you know, like he'd shoot this laser beam and throw the little laser discs and stuff like this. And I loved Ultraman. Ultraman had this little light. You see that light on his chest there? It's blue when he's happy and strong. Okay, like that. But then when he gets weak and he's like fighting Japanese dinosaurs and some lizard is attacking him or something, his light starts to blink red, red, red. And you're like, oh no, Ultraman, your light's blinking. And, and then it starts blinking faster and you're like, you're getting weak. And then at the final step, he'd just go, shwack, and he'd go up and he'd fly to the sun. And when he got close to the sun, he'd get all the power back. And then he'd come back to earth, like, ready to fight the lizard man. And I was like, whoo, man, he barely made it this time. I think of Jesus kind of like Ultraman in that sense. That here at this point, Jesus is like, his light is blinking and he's overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And I don't know. And then he goes, man, I know what to do. I just got to pray. And he prays and comes back. Rise, let's go. Here comes my betrayer. That's what Jesus did. That's what we need to do when we're losing that battle of will. When we're feeling weak and all, weak and all of us. When our little light is going red, 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 red. We've all dealt with that. People are letting you down. People aren't praying for you. People aren't calling you back. People aren't getting with you. Pray. Go to the sun. Get the strength. The stronger resolve. Come back, ready to live it out. That works. It really does work. The effectiveness of prayer. The effectiveness of prayer. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. There's so many incredible effects. Too many that we could talk about here. But we began last week talking about divine intervention. We talk here today, closer relationship clearer perspective, stronger resolve. Your prayers are powerful and effective. Mm -hmm. My encouragement to you, use it. Pray more this week. More quantity and more quality. And to God be the glory as we enjoy this incredible gift of prayer. Amen. Amen.